The unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Kosambi in a simsapa grove. Then the Blessed One took up a few simsapa leaves in his hand and addressed the monks thus. What do you think, monks? Which is more numerous? These few leaves that I have taken up in my hand or those in the grove overhead? Venerable Sir, the leaves that the Blessed One has taken up in his hand are few, but those in the grove overhead are numerous. So too, monks, the things I have directly known but have not taught you are numerous, while the things I have taught you are few. And why, monks, have I not taught these many things? Because they are without benefit, irrelevant to the fundamentals of the spiritual life, and do not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. Therefore, I have not taught them. And what monks have I taught? I have taught, this is suffering. I have taught, this is the origin of suffering. I have taught, this is the cessation of suffering. I have taught, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And why, monks, have I taught this? Because this is beneficial, relevant, to the fundamentals of the spiritual life and leads to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. Therefore, I have taught this. Therefore, monks, an exertion should be made to understand this is suffering and an exertion should be made to understand this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And this is from a handful of leaves um, in the book, In the Buddha's Words. And although he is addressing the monks here, because he is most often with the monks, um, it refers to everyone. In my opinion, the Buddha was very wise in doing this. He knew what people were like. If he told them all the wondrous things he had discovered and seen, Many would have become distracted by all this and wanted to have experiences and wouldn't have been interested in what actually would lead to the cessation of suffering. Um, It wouldn't have been helpful and it could have led to confusion and doubt. Reverend Master Jiyu used to say that you can't feed steak to babies. Their systems aren't ready for it. She She actually had to be careful how and when she taught us what she knew and understood. And in fact, in 1976, after her um, third Kensho, when she started talking very openly about past lives, some of the monks left. I think some were afraid and some thought she was being heretical, that this wasn't a part of Zen. The Four Noble Truths are very basic to all Buddhist traditions and there is great depth in these simple teachings. They are what the Buddha taught at the first sermon he gave after his enlightenment to the five ascetics who had helped him during his period of self-mortification. He discovered these truths on the night of his enlightenment. These truths can lead to enlightenment if penetrated, understood, and followed. During this sermon, one of the ascetics, Kondana, had a profound insight into these truths. And what did Kondana understand? All that is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is, nothing is self. It is said that when people awaken to these truths, they enter the stream of the Dharma, or the Noble Eightfold Path. As you all know, our thoughts and feelings arise and pass They are just passing phenomena. When we give them reality, believe in them, and act on them, 
then we suffer. When we penetrate to the heart of the Four Noble Truths, as Kondana did, we know We know what he knew, and we no longer are ruled by the self. And this can happen um, just gradually, just starting to see how the thoughts arise and pass if we don't um, get involved in them, and, and see their unreality. They're, they're nothing, really. Um, I'm going to be talking about the first and second noble truths today, together because uh, I find that I can't really separate them. The first noble truth, says the Buddha, is this. What is the noble truth of suffering? Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Sickness is suffering. Dissociation with the loved is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. In short, the five categories affected by clinging are suffering. This is the noble truth of suffering. Such was the vision, insight, wisdom, knowing, and light that arose in me about things not heard before. Now, he says this after um, every aspect of each of the truths, so I'm not going to read it uh, again. The noble, this noble truth must be penetrating by fully understanding suffering. And this is important. This noble truth has been penetrated. What can we learn from this? Suffering needs to be understood, allowing suffering into our awareness with no judgment. The Buddha understood the human condition and knew how our minds work. We humans have the tendency to turn away from suffering and to try and find pleasure and happiness. He's telling us that it's okay to feel the pain of suffering. Don't run away from it. Penetrate it. Know it. There is a way out of suffering, but it means going through it, not avoiding it. It takes a lot of courage to just be with whatever is arising, to not see it as bad or wrong or something we shouldn't feel or think. If I were a good person, I wouldn't feel angry about such and such. This can actually be very subtle, and you may not even be aware of your attitude unless you're being mindful. I can see myself automatically trying to control my mind when I'm in a situation in which anger or another uncomfortable feeling might arise. I don't want to feel the anger or frustration. It's not good to feel these things, or it's very uncomfortable to feel these things. I don't want to be that way. There are many shoulds and should nots we've been conditioned to believe in. Through meditation and training, we can actually start to let go of our conditioning, our shoulds and should nots. One of the negative results of trying to control and not feel anger or whatever is that we may suddenly, out of the blue, burst into anger um, without having any idea of what's going on and do something we sooner or later regret. Or we suddenly burst into tears when we thought we were okay about something. Through the Buddha's all-embracing compassion and kindness and his true body, his Dharma body, people could see that suffering could be transcended and um, that there was something wonderful about transcending it. In seeing and hearing the Buddha, there must have been a pull for some, towards finding what he had found on the night of his enlightenment. He was someone completely at peace, totally grounded in reality, radiant, wise, and compassionate. And he told people that they could find and know what he had found. And those with little dust in their eyes would hear the truth in his words, as did Kondana and eventually the other four ascetics. Because of the depths of the Buddha's meditation and understanding, his true words would resonate in their hearts. You probably all had some experience of hearing a Dharma talk or reading something or talking to someone and the deeper truth resonates in your heart. When Reverend Master Ji would give Dharma talks on the Shobogenzo, 
I generally couldn't understand what she was saying with her words, but often something deeper would resonate, and that's how I would listen to her talks. The second noble truth. What is the noble truth of the origin of suffering? It is craving, which renews being and is accomplished by relish and lust. Relishing this and that, in other words, craving for sensual desires, craving for being, craving for non-being. But whereon does this craving arise and flourish? Wherever there is what seems lovable and gratifying, thereon it arises and flourish. flourishes. This is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. This noble truth must be penetrated by abandoning the origin of suffering. This noble truth has been penetrated by abandoning the origin of suffering. This noble, this truth is telling us if we want to find an end to suffering, we need to abandon, let go of craving. And as the first noble truth, we first need to penetrate it by knowing, and just as with the first noble truth, we first need to penetrate suffering by knowing it and seeing it within ourselves, just as with any feeling or thought, we allow the feelings of craving, desire, lust, to just be there. In one of his books, Ajahn Munindo tells a lovely story about a female lay trainee who would walk on her way to work, I believe on her way to work, past a pastry shop. She would generally go in and have a pastry, and she would enjoy it thoroughly. But eventually, when she would go in, she would eat more and more pastries. And she knew at that point that her greed was out of control. But it felt almost like an addiction and that she couldn't stop herself, and she wanted to. So she went and spoke with Ajahn Munindo about it. Then she thought she had found a solution by walking another way to work and not going by the pastry shop so that her greed wouldn't arise. It seemed to her that it was working, but when she mentioned this to Ajahn Munindo, he suggested another way, which was to go back to walking down the original street and when she got to in front of the pastry shop to stop there and see what happened, to allow the craving to be there and not to leave until she had it under control. And this worked for her. I'm not suggesting this... um, as a way to deal with drug or alcohol addiction, but it's an example of neither running away from craving nor indulging it. And sometimes it does take until it's an actual addiction, until until we're really suffering with something before we see a need to let it go. I'd like to talk about the three forms of craving mentioned um, by the Buddha. The first one is easy to to understand, the craving for sensual pleasures. It's what the senses perceive and want, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. Craving for being is interesting. I always thought of it as wanting to exist in the sense of being alive, and perhaps it is on one level. However, John Sumedho describes it as wanting the self to exist in some way wanting to become something or someone, Um, being ambitious, wanting to be a success, to be something, to be wealthy, to be liked, to be loved, to be respected, to be recognized, wanting to please others, to be a good or clever person. And you can see, I'm sure you've all had experiences of this leading to suffering because when you don't become what you want to become or you don't get what you want, um, then you're unhappy. We want to be a me, a self, even an awful me, 
as long as there is a me. Otherwise, there is the unknown. The craving for non-being, I thought, was the desire not to be alive. Ajahn Sumedho explains this as wanting things to be different than what they are, wanting to get rid of something, like your anger or greed, or suffering of any kind, wanting to get rid of it, any aspect of yourself that you don't want to be there. I'd rather be this kind of person than what I am now. There's something wrong with me. I don't want to be like this. One of the beauties of training, which I have found, is um, the gradual acceptance of who I am. Not that I don't want to change me, I do, but I can accept that this is how I react in certain situations. This is how I am. You know, I'm never going to be that kind of person. This is who I am, and it's okay. I've spent many years trying to get rid of uncomfortable states of mind, especially the suffering after making a mistake in training, like breaking a precept, and the same many years trying to have positive states of mind, wanting to be at peace, to have certainty, to be a better monk, to be liked and accepted. And uh, these all lead to suffering. We are taught not to hold on to our suffering, to let it go. A John Sumato says, to let go of suffering, we have to admit it fully into consciousness. And this means whatever is going on in the mind, the greed, craving, ill will, judgments of self and other, jealousy, meanness, anger, stress, worry, fear, from the moment to moment thoughts that arise and pass, the ideas we attach to, to deep grief, loss, painful memories, old karma, what we've done in the past, etc. When we are mindful and can see these things as they arise, we can choose not to act on them, to be pulled here and there by them, to just let them be there until they pass. The important thing is not to see your thoughts and feelings as real or who you are, not to see them as me or mine, no matter how ingrained, convincing, or painful they might be. They are impermanent and not self. And again from a John Sumedho. The Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara listens to the sounds of the universe. This is an image I find quite meaningful. It is like a suggestion of being this in the present and let whatever is going on be what it is. I now no longer fight the pain in the body or the imperatives for my ego, but recognize them. This awareness is what I regard as pure. It has no flaws, no blemishes. The warts and diseases, as well as the good stuff, come and go, but what remains is always this awareness, this natural conscious awareness of non-grasping and non-identification. In this way, I have affirmed it, This is it. This is the way it is. The high-minded ideals, the altruism, the fears, the desires, and the dark side have an inner perspective of dharma. They are seen for what they are and are no longer threatening. I am threatened as a personality. My personality gets threatened. I still feel this sense of being threatened, but the awareness of it is what I rest in. I am no longer trying to figure out what I am afraid of, how to get rid of it, or who to blame. When you begin to trust in the awareness, you see personality belief, doubt, and attachment to conventions in terms of dharma. You also see that you create them. They are not natural energies. They are artifices that you add to the present moment, that you put onto your experience. Once the illusion is broken and seen through, You see the path. You see the way. Now, the kind of suffering you could be feeling as you listen to this is, well, I can't be aware all the time. My mind wanders a lot. And I'm not able to be with all my suffering. I can't do it. So I'm a bad trainee. For me, allowing all these things into my awareness and the acceptance of them 
has been a gradual process as my faith has grown. And there are still areas that are difficult for me. And I think it took a John Semedo years of training before he was able to rest in this awareness, which we would call Buddha nature. And uh, in his book, Don't Take Your Life Personally, which um, I'm quoting from here, from a John Semedo, he, he does talk about all his difficulties. He's very open about them. John Sumato also says that we need not be discouraged when we're not aware all the time, or even most of the time. Be glad when occasionally you notice and bring yourself back to awareness. And River Master Mayan has said that it's not whether we wander off that's important, but whether we come back when we notice. If we are aware or mindful, we notice all the pulls of the mind and see that we can choose how to respond. We don't have to respond to all the greeds that arise, or, or, or the anger, or delusion. That which promises us pleasure, happiness, fulfillment, or the avoidance of something painful, that which, we may, give, that which may give us momentary pleasure, happiness, or a release from suffering. I sometimes have this image of my mind, and when I was preparing this talk, I actually had this image. Um, have this image of my mind out there somewhere in front of me, pulling me here and there. The mind can be so convincing. And it, it actually might be more accurate to say that the object, thought, or feeling is out there, and the mind goes out to meet it. Resting in awareness or Buddha nature is perhaps what happens naturally when we don't go charging after our thoughts and feelings and giving them reality. And I found when I was out at the Hermitage preparing these talks, um, listening to all this good teaching was really helpful for me. And um, when I would actually just be with all the pulls and all that was going on, um, I actually did find my, and not responding to them, I actually did find myself resting in this awareness. And it was very, very pleasant and peaceful. Not a quote from the Buddha about enduring suffering. Bhikkhus, suppose there were a man with a lifespan of a hundred years who could live a hundred years someone would say to him, Come, good man, in the morning they will strike you with a hundred spears. At noon they will strike you with a hundred spears. In the evening they will strike you with a hundred spears. And you, good man, being struck, well, I could say good woman too, being struck day after day by three hundred spears will have a lifespan of a hundred spears, will live a hundred years, will have a lifespan of a hundred years, will live a hundred years, and then after a hundred years have passed, you will make the breakthrough to the Four Noble Truths, to which you had not broken through before. It is fitting, bhikkhus, for a clansman intent on his good to accept the offer. For what reason? Because this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point cannot be discerned by blows by spears, by blows by swords, by blows by axes. And even though this may be so, bhikkhus, I do not say that the breakthrough to the Four Noble Truths is accompanied by suffering or by displeasure. Rather, the breakthrough to the Four Noble Truths is accompanied only by happiness and joy. And because the... um, the bhikkhus were who were most with the Buddha. Most of these are addressing the bhikkhus. However, um, I'm sure that some of his talks were addressed to um, both the male and female monks and um, pertain to both of them, even if they weren't. And they also pertain, obviously, to the lay trainees. When I first read this, I thought that's a bit much to ask. But later, when I was having some difficulties, it came back, it came up, 
and I understood. It's the willingness to be with our suffering and not try to run away from it or try to feel better. And it's the willing to be with it as long as it takes because this in the end allows suffering to cease. It's this willingness, along with the work of trying not to create more suffering, more karma, that allows us to awaken and know the joy and peace of nirvana. One form of suffering that I have is the turning away from myself, and I suspect others do this as well, not feeling that we are able to just be with what arises, especially if you feel like we're being struck with a hundred spears three times a day. The Buddha said that patient endurance is the highest austerity. Can we patiently endure now, since we've been practicing the Buddhist way, what we couldn't endure in the past? Ajahn Chah has something to say about this. My path of training people involves some suffering, because suffering is the Buddha's path to enlightenment. He wanted us to see suffering and to see its origination, cessation, and the path. This is the way out for all the Arya, the awakened ones. If you don't go this way, there is no way out. The only way is knowing suffering, knowing the cause of suffering, knowing the cessation of suffering, and knowing the path of practice leading to the cessation of suffering. This is the way that the Arya, beginning with stream entry, were able to escape. It's necessary to know suffering. When we are mindful, we can often see that we have a choice of just being with anger, frustration, or whatever, and feeling that discomfort or acting on it and feeling perhaps a temporary release from suffering. The former is the suffering that leads to its cessation, and the latter I think we all know about. Ajahn Sumedho talks about welcoming everything. In the Theravada tradition, we have this word metta, loving kindness, and metta is about welcoming everything. As many of you know, we develop metta beginning with ourselves. The formula we use is something like, may I abide in well-being. So the first part of the practice is always directed towards yourself, just learning to accept yourself for what you are. This means welcoming and accepting everything about yourself, your dark side, your good side, your bright side, your stupid side, your evil side, whatever, learning to accept uncritically even the things you really don't like about yourself. Metta, then, is a sense of being at home, of allowing, of accepting, and being patient with what you don't like and don't want, of allowing what you find irritating, disgusting, and revolting, whatever. It is a question of learning not to get lost in reactions, but rather to be patient and accepting to welcome even the dark side of your experience. That takes patience, doesn't it? For me, at least, it does, because emotionally I am conditioned to trying to push things away, trying to get rid of them. Patient acceptance is also about welcoming the good side, but in a way that doesn't demand it. When happiness is present, welcome it. Allow it to arise but also allow it to cease. To be able to do this takes attentiveness, takes this still point, this sense of pure present, which includes all that is right now. I see this as learning to be with yourself right now and not going from one thing to the other, always looking ahead and expecting something better in the next moment or activity. If we do this, we're never present. We're always somewhere else, and we miss our opportunity opportunity to train with whatever is going on right now. And it's also about seeing that being with yourself right now, no matter how you are feeling, is enough. We don't have to try to feel better or have a better experience. We can just be with what is. 
And I'd like to quote from someone who isn't officially a Buddhist. He's a very well-known poet named Rumi. And some of you may have heard this poem. It's called The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So now I'd like to come to our deep suffering, or the suffering of the that we, or the suffering of the world, or seeing the suffering of someone, human or animal, that we love. People often ask, "How do I deal with the suffering of the world?" As I mentioned yesterday, someone who is training can feel the suffering of others deeply and yet not become overwhelmed by by it because you have learned not to run away from suffering and you know you can be with it and you know that there is something deeper than the suffering. And I have found that there is always something helping us, especially when we need it most. Um, And we don't have to watch the news every night. And we don't need to to try to feel the suffering of others. I had the experience a couple years ago of watching another being suffer and not being able to do anything about it. And I know some of you have had this experience with your pets as well. My cat Maisie and I had a strong karmic connection, and I loved her deeply. When she was close to 14, we discovered a tumor in her mouth, and I had to make the decision whether to have it surgically removed or not. The chances of the surgery helping weren't that great. It might prolong her life, but if they didn't get it all, um, it would just most likely start growing again. And the surgery and afterwards would have been very painful for her. Also, she had a number of ailments, and it seemed like her body was just ready to go. However, I was torn between surgery and and no surgery, and it was a hard decision to make. I went and stood in front of the Kishti Garba statue by the guest house and meditated and asked for help. I felt at peace and had the sense that whichever way I went, it was okay and I decided for her not to have the surgery. It really seemed like the way to go. Because the tumor kept growing, she had a very painful period before she died. She couldn't drink water and she desperately wanted to. She refused any help that I offered to to try to get water into her mouth. I could see that she was suffering a great deal and um, She couldn't actually accept her. It seemed like she wasn't accepting her situation. Because I loved her, I felt her suffering, and I couldn't turn away. It was a very painful experience for me. It's hard to describe, and yet at times it wasn't there. Um, So I didn't hold on to it when it wasn't there. And it helped me because it had been difficult in the past for me to look suffering right in the eye, and I had to. It was rough, but I didn't turn away. She died during the 10 Precepts retreat two years ago. We had her funeral on the last day of the retreat, and I believe everyone came to it. It was an incredible ceremony where I felt that Maisie's karma had been burned up by the suffering she had experienced during the dying process. 
And there was a sense of interconnectedness with all the people attending the ceremony and offering incense for her. There was a oneness in the universality of suffering and an, open, and an openness in allowing it to be there. Many of the people at the funeral were offering incense and merit for their own past, who had, their own pet who had died. It wasn't only about the universality of suffering, there was a sense of oneness in the radiance of Buddha nature. So the Buddha said, I teach two things, suffering and the cessation of suffering. I pray that we may all find its cessation quickly. Homage to all the Buddhas in all worlds. Homage to all the Bodhisattvas in all worlds. Homage to the scripture of great wisdom.